let me now introduce Sieb Sturman. Um, Sieb Sturman is Professor Emeritus of the History of Ideas in Utrecht University. From 1994 to 2010, he held a Jean Monnet Chair in European History at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. And from 1985 to 1994, he held the Chair of the History of Political Thought in the University of Amsterdam. His main research interests include global intellectual history, the dialectic of equality and inequality in world history, citizenship in world history, European state formation, the history of liberalism and liberal political thought, the history of European feminism. Seep has published widely in the history of ideas, including his books, The Invention of Humanity, uh, François Poulin de la Barre, and The Invention of Modern Equality, both with the Harvard University Press, in 2005, Sieb was awarded the George Moss Prize by uh, American Historical Association. He has also edited a number of volumes, including uh, Beyond the Canon History for the 21st Century, also Perspectives on Feminist Political Thought in European History, and written numerous articles appearing in journals such as Journal of World History, Journal of the History of Ideas, History and Theory, and many others. Seep will now talk for about 50 minutes, after which there will be time for some questions. If you have a question, please uh, just mark with an X in the chat. If our connection starts slowing down, down I, I kindly ask you to please uh, turn off the videos. Uh, if it does not, please do keep them on. And again, please make sure you're muted during uh, Seep's talk. A final note uh, before we start, this session is being recorded. So Seep, uh, I am so pleased you're here and uh, I'm so happy to pass on the word to you. Thank you. Uh, Seep, uh, Seep, sorry, you are muted. You, yes, perfect. No, no, it's right. Yes. Ah. No, I began over again. Um, I'm happy to be here and thank you for your invitation to come to this wonderful conference. But of course, here is not quite here. I'm not at Amsterdam, neither at Utrecht University. I'm speaking from a remote village in the French Alps, but there's no thunderstorm today, so everything is all right. If there's a thunderstorm, I have to close down the computer. Um, I'm going to speak about a very mainstream subject, the history of political economy, but I believe that's important because looking at Adam Smith and above all at David Ricardo, you come at the core of what is today the foundation of neoliberal global economy. And that is that greater and freer markets are always best and protection is always bad. I'm going to question that and, and my story conclusion of my story will be that protectionism and free trade are both contingent choices and that for some countries protection may be better and has demonstrably been better in the past. I shall now get in the way. Um, if you want to see an angry economist, an angry mainstream economist, I mean, you must question the virtues of free trade. In, in the New York Times, the, in his New York Times column, Nobel laureate Paul Krugman regularly lambasts the advocates of protectionism as latter day obscurantists who have yet to see the light. Looking at the history of free trade and protectionism, the historian cannot avoid noting a paradox. Most economists may favor free trade, but most economic actors in the history of the last two or three centuries did not. In particular, many states which have successfully industrialized pursued protectionist politics. In this lecture, I shall focus on economic inequality between nations and states. I will question the view held by the majority of modern economists that free trade is always and everywhere better than protectionism. I will further question the absolute validity of Ricardo's famous theorem of comparative advantage. And I will seek to demonstrate that free trade in the two country model is only advantage to both countries when the economic disparities between them are not too great. 
And it will do that by taking apart Ricardo's own example of Portuguese wine and English, English textiles. Looking back from the late 20th century, the entire period from the 1860s to 1914 has often been regarded as an era of trade liberalization, which was favorably contrasted to the 1914-1945 years marked by war, nationalism, dictatorships, protectionism, and the Great Depression. The Genevan economic historian Paul Baroch, however, has shown that the free trade interlude was much shorter and lasted only from 1860 to 1879 when Bismarck landed, launched his new tariff policy. And even in the free trade interlude, tariffs were by no means absent. Look at Baroch data. Uh, I want now to see the, hand, the handout. Can you do that? Christian, yeah. can you show, the, ah, this is it. You see there that only the United Kingdom has zero tariffs. Then you have a number of countries, Norway, Sweden, the Netherlands, Germany, which have low tariffs, but not zero. And then you come to countries with around 10 to 25% tariffs. And if you then Europe compared to the United States, you see that Europe the whole of Europe is 6.8, 6 to 8. Continental Europe is 9 to 12, but the United States has a solid 40 to 50% tariffs. So the present day American economists and, and especially American po politicians often say that the, 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 well, the welfare and the prosperity of the United States is based on free trade, but then they don't know their own history. Between Bismarck's reversal and then in 1914, tariffs mounted almost everywhere. The European United Kingdom remained close to zero, but the British Empire, no, that did not. In India, the British Rai imposed 5% um, duty on most goods, but for non-British imports, the, the tariff was double of that, 10%. And that's an, that's an amount that is highly disadvantaged for people who were in the 10% range, countries. Moreover, in the 19th century, free trade was at gunpoint imposed on Japan, resulting in the unequal treaties of 1858, but after the Meiji reforms and the Japanese victory in the, victory in the 1894 war with China, the, the Japanese state was strong enough to obtain de facto tariff autonomy and embarked on a protectionist course. In the same period, several Japanese economists began to advocate protectionism. Of the successful industrializers that also became great powers, only the European United Kingdom practiced free trade. The United States, France, Germany, and Japan did not. So protectionism is not only good for backward states and import substitution, but is also good for large, large state, imperial states, and which were not the United Kingdom. The Japanese case further demonstrates that, that trade liberalization imposed by foreign powers may lead to regime change, regime change and the protectionist response. The deindustrialization of textile and manufacturers in the 19th century Latin America is also explained, not, in, not totally, but in part, by an imposed liberalization. Against this background, I will now discuss the arguments for free trade practice presented by Adam Smith and David Ricardo in the economic, political, and intellectual context of their times. I will show that arguments that are presented as purely economic are on close, on close reading politico-economic hybrids. In a global perspective, the arguments for free trade were also centric. Smith and Ricardo looked outward from the region where they resided, that is, from the United Kingdom, or more generally from the vantage point of Europe's Northwestern Atlantic Rim. How to apply the generic concept of globalization in a historical credible way? We should be wary of a linear temporal, temporal framework placing cities, countries, and re region on a continuum from less developed to highly developed. Instead, I propose to envision globalization as combined and unequal development. The full economic homogenization of the planet will always remain a receding target. 
and sizable disparities in economic and technological capacities will not disappear in the future. After 1770, so in the time of Adam Smith, uh, a number of important books were published that highlighted the growing silence of empires and global connections to the European literate public. The two most influential of these were Guillaume Thomas Reynaud, Histoire philosophique et politique des établissements et du commerce des Européens dans les deux Indes. This is a book about um, global European expansion on, on all continents, not only colonization of America and South Asia, but there's also a long chapter about the Russian colonization of Siberia. And it was a bestseller. Three editions, 1770, 1770, 1774, 1780. 1780 edition is, is 10 volumes, and now it doesn't go for less. In 1776, also, of course, appeared Adam Smith's An Inquiry into the Nature and the Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Both, both Smith and Renal start from the assumption that free trade will engender mutual advantage for all peoples and nations in the world. Renal begins his massive treatise with the observation that the conquest of America and the opening up of the Indian Ocean to European shipping which represent a world historical turning point. And I quote, it was then that people from the most distant lands were joined together by new connections and new needs. The products of the equatorial regions were consume, consumed in climates near the pole. The, the produce of the north is transported to the south. The raiments of the Orient, the raiments of the Orient have become the luxuries of the Occidental, and everywhere men have mutually ex exchanged their opinions, their laws, their customs, their diseases, their, their remedies, their, their virtues and their vices. Everything has changed and must change yet more. Note the, the, the broadness of this concept of globalization, not only economic, but also cultural and political and intellectual. And note also the last sentence, everything has changed and must change yet more. So there is a temporality of development and progression here. Adam Smith did not formulate an explicit concept of globalization, but like Renault, he declared that the discovery of America and that of a passage to the East Indies are the two greatest and most important events in the history of mankind. So he's, he's from with Renault that this is a world historical turning point from which there is no going back. What Smith says about the relationships between the division of labor and the extent of the market clearly assumes an expanding space of worldwide commerce with the European Atlantic Rim at its epicenter. After having explained in the opening chapter of the Wealth of Nations that productivity increases faster in manufacture than in agriculture, Smith explains that the division of labor, which he sees as the wellspring of growth and prosperity, increases with the extent of markets in Europe as well as globally. Smith further notes that the division of labor is most advanced in countries which enjoy the highest degree of industry and improvement, and also, and that is important, who are among the paragons of good government. Good government is a government that protects property. Note the political economic hybrid at the core of Smith's historical vision. It is economic, extent of the market, division of labor, but it's also political, the notion of good government. And Smith's readers would perfectly understand what good government mean, meant, not like in Russia. It has to be stressed that Smith, while extremely critical of British colonial policy, highly appreciated the positive effects and net gains of the European colonial empires. And I quote, the general advantage that Europe's discovery and colonization of America consist first in the increase of its enjoyments, and second, in the augmentation of its industry. There he regards Europe as a, as a great single country. Even so, Smith observed that the monopolistic rights the mother countries have preserved for themselves and for their chartered companies have made those augmentations below what they would otherwise be. Accordingly, Smith underlines that Britain's American colonies are the foremost victims of the, its mercantilist malpractices. 
like Renault, decided to wish the young United States bid for independence. The Seven Years' War, the first European war with global ramifications, Smith opined was principally a colony quarrel. France was ousted from their strongholds in India. Uh, the, the English won Canada, and France held its colonies in the Caribbean. Contrary to Renault, who liked the European colonizers uh, to cruel vultures and a new type of savages, Smith saw the overall trend of European global predominance as part of the progress of civilization. In ancient times, and I quote, the opulent and civilized found it difficult to defend themselves against the poor and barbarous nations. In modern times, the poor and barbarous find it difficult to defend themselves against the opulent and civilized. The invention of firearms, an invention that at first sight appears to be so pernicious, is certainly favorable both to the permanence and the extension of civilization. Here the ways of Smith and Renault parted. While Renault criticized colonialism, Smith only criticized colonial policy. In their aversion to monopolistic practice and chartered companies, however, Smith and Renault concurred. On top of that, both Smith and Renault noticed the import of the transformation of the British East India Company from a merchant association into a territorial power in the wake of the conquest and plunder of Bengal by Robert Clive and Warren Hastings. It is important to see that Smith's above critique of the East India Company is not circumstantial or driven by short-term political maneuvers. Smith continue refers to his own theory of good markets as the system of natural liberty. He sincerely believed that his economic prospect, precepts sorry, were based on a correct reading of human nature, while mercantilism was grounded in a misreading of human nature. The fortunes of Europe, and in particular Britain and its colonies, dominate Smith's perspective of the global. That is, his geographical is centric in that sense. If only Britain would abandon its harmful mercantilist malpractices, free the American white settler colonies, and put an end to the unnatural monopoly of the East India Company, Smith mused, a better future would appear on the horizon. Once more, we must be careful not to misread Smith. He did not seek to break up the empire. Quite the contrary, he wanted to transform it into an imperial federation that would adopt a sound economic policy. The capital of the future confederation, Smith conjectured, need not remain in London, but could and should be transferred to the future economic center of the federation. Smith probably conjectured that Washington or New York would become the new central place of a refurbished empire. But we, looking back from a post-colonial world, may well ask, why not Delhi? Well, India, we should recall, was in Smith's time far richer than the small strip of the 13 colonies on the American seaboard. In Smith's general formulation, natural liberty looked like the natural destiny of humanity. But looking at Smith's prospects for the British Empire, I feel justified to conclude that the enlarged liberty of an economic sphere was not only natural, it was also vital. And now we come to perhaps the most famous economist still read today by most people interested in international trade. I mean, of course, David Ricardo. He was a, a Jew who came from Amsterdam. Transfer, his father brought him to Britain. He was educated from an early age in stockbroking, but he married a Quaker woman and uh, became a Unitarian, was thereafter disinherited by his father. I, my, the story begins in 1815. Britain had imposed an import duty on corn to protect the income of its farmers and landlords. The manufacturers protested, of course, because the high price of corn frustrated their, attem their attempts to lower the wages of labor. This dispute occasioned a polemic between the two foremost economists of the time, Thomas Robert Malthus and David Ricardo, with Malthus defending protectionism, which he had still rejected in 1814, and Ricardo championing free trade. Malthus' chief argument was strategic. He feared that British dependence on the import of food would weaken the country in the case of a new European war. 
the debate was in February 1815. Napoleon escaped from Elba at the end of February and entered France on the 1st of March. So Napoleon was still on everyone's mind and the, and the, the blockade of the coast of Europe. And that explains Maltu's approach. Ricardo retorted that there were so many agricultural countries that Britain could always switch to other exporters of corn or let them compete with one another for a share of the expanding British market. What I take from their polemics is not what they disagreed about, but an assumption they shared. Both carved up the world in agricultural countries and manufacturing countries. And both Both posited that the manufacturer countries were wealthier and more productive than the agricultural ones. And finally, both agreed that the agricultural countries were far more numerous than the manufacturing countries. One gets sometimes the impression that the only real manufacturing country was England, with perhaps the Dutch Republic and France added to it. Adam Smith, Ricardo stated in, the, in his Principles of Political Economy and Taxation, now in 1817, has shown that free trade will affect the best distribution of labor in the world. Even so, Ricardo feels the need for a more general and watertight demonstration. To accomplish this, he uses the famous example of Portuguese wine and British cloth, woolen cloth in particular. Although Portuguese cloth is cheaper than British cloth, its wine is cheaper to a greater extent than English wine which is a very scarce item in relation to English consumer demand. Think of the amounts of wine, all those dukes, viscounts, earl and lords daily go down. It follows that Britain should specialize in the manufacture of cloth and Portugal in the cultivation of wine grapes. Ultimately, everyone will have more wine and more cloth by spending the same amount of labor. In a footnote, Ricardo used another example to demonstrate the validity of this principle, that of a hatter and a shoemaker in the national market. If the superior man has an advantage of 20% in hats, but an advantage of 33% in shoes, the best arrangement is that the superior producer makes only shoes and the other all the, bad, all the hats. This is the core of the theorem of comparative advantage that most mainstream economists still accept today. Ricardo then moves from shoes and hats to the vision of an optimal global division of power. It is this principle, and I quote, which determines that wine shall be made in Portugal and France, that corn shall be grown in America and Poland, and that hardware and other goods shall be manufactured in England. Elsewhere he declares that the rich manufacturer countries will specialize in capital intensive product, while the poor agricultural countries, where labor is plentiful and cheap, will specialize in labor intensive products. And we now descend from this model to the grim realities of history. If we insert Ricardo's theorem of comparative advantage in the rich poor countries paradigm, what will be the economic outcome in the long run? On this matter, Ricardo is completely silent, but we may assume not entirely ignorant. He must have known that um, he must have known that the division of labor between Portugal and Britain had evolved under the combined impact of market forces and three 17th century Anglo-Portuguese commercial treaties, kept by the 1703 Maturin Treaty, concluded at the beginning of the War of the Spanish Succession. The economic regime finally legalized in 1703 was not one of across-the-board free trade. The wine trade was only partly free. London promised to keep duties on Portuguese wine at a maximum of two-thirds of the tariff on French wines. In exchange, British woolen cloth was in Portugal and its colonies would be entirely duty-free. This political economic regime gave English, English manufacturers of woolen cloth access to the markets of Portugal and its colonies, notably the vast Brazilian market. The outcome was that the Portuguese textile manufacture, a typical infant industry, was virtually eliminated. Portugal became a producer of primarily most agricultural, mostly agricultural goods. It should be recalled that in the 18th century, cloth manufacture was the most dynamic sector in most European countries. Moreover, 
1770 treaty had given British ship shipping preferential rights on all, all transports from British to Portuguese harbors. So that by 1715, more than half of Portugal's trade was in British hands. Because Portugal had a deficit on the balance of trade, it paid with Brazilian gold. Some 75% of the gold won by the Portuguese in Brazil eventually found its way to London. On top of these economic losses, the wine export fortified the political power of the great land landowners and their clients at the expense of the urban elites in Portugal. The Portuguese landed aristocracy was an, is, is, has been characterized as an ultra rentier class with mostly un-entrepreneurial -entrep habits. They left off tribute in, imposed by the crown on the wine growers who did all the work, but didn't get much money. Neither the crown nor the landowners were much interested in creating a property regime favorable to manufacturers, because it might occasion the question of their own economic and political privileges. That Ricardo was well aware of Portuguese backwardness is apparent from his observation of Spain and Portugal in his principles. And I quote, to the feudal system has been abolished in Spain and Portugal, it had not yet been succeeded by much better. Actually, the first stage of the dismantling of the Portuguese feudal system only began in 1820. From the above, we can draw two conclusions. In the first place, the division of labor between Britain and Portugal was not the natural outcome of the free market. It was, it was the result of a continuous interplay of political, military, and economic factors. And second, the free trade in textiles legalized by the Maturin Treaty was not mutually beneficial. Britain profited from it, and woolen cloth amounted to more than 80% at that time of all exports from London. The export to Portugal was a sizable portion of that, thus contributing to the export-driven economic growth that underpinned the coalition between finance and London interest in London and Southern England. On the other hand, Portuguese textile manufacturers had lost a great part of the export market. The attempt of the energetic Portuguese minister Pombal to revive it by means of protectionist duties in the late 18th century made a promising start, but did not survive the economic shocks of the Napoleonic Wars. During the wars, a new commercial Anglo-Portuguese treaty was concluded in 1810, which gave Brit Britain a veto over Portuguese tariff policy. So much for free trade. After the 1821 abrogation of that the 19, 1810 treaty, uh, Lisbon returned to protectionism. That and the loss of Brazil, which became independent in 1825, made Coven take a new look at manufacturers. Even so, the Portuguese economy was still dominated by wine until the eve of the Second World War. As for Ricardo, he never investigated the long-term consequence of free trade. According to Arthur Bloomfront, who wrote a book about uh, the, the obstacles to free trade, himself famously in favor of them. The relations between trade and economic growth were treated by most 19th century economists as a sideshow. There can be no doubt, he states, and I quote, that the core of classical trade theory, and in fact, trade theory generally up to the 1950s, was fundamentally static in its assumptions and approach. So static that certain, certain inequalities became impossible to see. I now will formulate some general conclusions and then come briefly to our time, the present day, present hyperglobalization and uh, the present demand for more and more free trade. The first conclusion I take from the Anglo-Portuguese case is that the Ricardian free trade regime will in many cases result in an increase, increase of global economic inequality. The real world of history being a world of unequal and combined development, the plight of Portuguese stands for the, policy, for the plight of many relatively poor countries, specializing in agriculture and other primary goods. Consequently, global free trade is not always beneficial for all countries. For less developed countries, protection or a combination 
that judicious combination of protection and free trade may work better. And one can have free trade in some goods and protection in other markets. My second conclusion, which will be more contestable for mainstream economists, is that rich or medium rich countries may also benefit from protection. The rule, the rule in the historical world from Adam Smith to the present day was a combination of protection and free trade. With the exception of European Britain, all successfully industrializing states have used a mixture of free trade and protection. That the historical lessons on protection and free trade did not go unheeded is beautifully illustrated by an exchange in 1955 when the United, the United States and Japan were negotiating their first post occupation trade agreement. The American delegate, Taylor White, argued that his country favored the liberalization of world trade. Japan, he concluded, should lift its import controls on American automobiles and devote itself to export items in which it, it enjoyed a comparative advantage. Toyo's negotiator, Kenichi Obe, who also knew as Ricardo, retorted, if the CEO of international trade were, protect, were pursued to its ultimate conclusions, the United States would specialize in automobiles and Japan in the production of tuna fish. Needless to say, that was not the future the Japanese, Japanese had in mind for themselves. This leads me to a third, third conclusion. International negotiations on free trade and protection are not only about an optimal global division of labor, but also about prospective geopolitical distributions of economic and political power. The European Union, for instance, supports global and regional liberalization of trade and has abolished internal tariffs in a large part of Europe, but at the same time, it acts as a protectionist bloc in its common agricultural policy. During the Euro crisis of the past decades, it has become clear that the economic disparities within Europe are great enough so that the single market has not been advantaged to countries like Greece. The Greece economy was, in the Euro crisis was virtually destroyed. Likewise, the United States, despite the Trumpian protectionist interlude, has supported global and regional trade liberalization, but itself clings, like Europe, to agricultural protection. China has created an internal, an internal state controlled free market, but its trade policy is not predicated on a clear distinction of economics and politics. When Western experts criticize Chinese policies as economically unsound, Beijing's response is often a polite version of so what. My fourth conclusion is that both Smith and Ricardo essentialized the market and the economic. They, they, they consider laissez-faire as natural and state intervention as artificial and often harmful. But as the economic anthropologist Karl Polanyi has long ago shown in his famous book, The Great Transformation, which he published in 1944, the same year that Hayek wrote to serfdom went to the press, laissez-faire is not the same as letting things go. It was a policy. Polanyi concluded, commenting on Britain after the new poor law of 1833, Peel's Bank Act of 1844, which made the pound convertible into gold, and the repeal of the Corn Laws in 1846, that there was nothing natural about laissez-faire. Free markets could never have come into being by allowing things to take their course. Laissez-faire itself was enforced by the state. In other words, laissez-faire was a political-economic hybrid. This hybridity can trace all its way back to the wealth of nations. Adam Smith, Adam Smith invokes the invisible hand and a well-governed society. Both are essential. The precondition of, and both are preconditions of a sound economic development. It follows that when we study the history of economic liberty and laissez-faire from Adam Smith to contemporary neoliberalism, we should pay attention to its non-economic components. In some cases, um, liberal trade liberalization was linked to political regimes that were liberal, as in Britain, but in other cases, to cultural or religious conservatism. My fifth and last conclusion takes me back once more to Adam Smith. At the core of his system of liberty lay a vision of human nature. When Smith accounts for the origin of the division of labor, he attributes this to the, to the very slow and gradual effect 
and I quote, of a certain propensity in human nature, to propens the propensity to truck, barter, and exchange one thing for another. Smith concludes that this propensity is common to all, man all men and to be found in no other race of animals. The foundation of Adam Smith's natural liberty, I conclude, is to, found, is to be found in his anthropology. But what kind of anthropology has Adam Smith? The core distinction of the anthropology is that rational self-interest is natural and altruism is non-natural. Many of its adherents appeal to the authority of Darwin to buttress this doctrine. Darwin himself, however, says in The Descent of Man, a tribe including many members who's, who from possessing in a high degree the spirit of patriotism, fidelity, courage, and sympathy, they're always ready to aid one another and to sacrifice themselves for the common good would be victorious over most other tribes. And this would be natural selection. So there's also natural selection on account of cooperation, not only on account of economic egoism. Right. Let me finish with a few observations on present day neoliberalism. As we know, Ronald Reagan, one of the political architects of neoliberalism, was fond of saying that the state is not a solution, the state is the problem. But Reagan's bon mot should not be taken literally. Neoliberals are not anarchists. They take for granted the police powers of the state and property and the property regimes they enforce. At every turn, they invoke the power of state laws and international treaties to protect property and markets against the encroachments of democratic movements representing claims to economic redistribution and progressive taxation. After the fall of Soviet communism, we are witnessing the rise of a new neoliberal regime dominated by global financial aristocracy. And I, it, is, it is advisedly that, it, that I use not the word elite, but aristocracy. An aristocracy that seeks to bypass and impair national democracy by inserting neoliberal free trade regimes in international treaties which today often involves setting aside the rule of law in favor of special tribunals for investor states conflicts. CETA, the free trade agreement between Canada and the European Union, which as far as I can see is not yet ratified by all countries, but the, the COVID noise has made invisible some things that are transacted in back rooms, so I may be wrong there, stipulates the, the, the free trade stipulates in an article on the tribunals that there is no appeal from the rulings of tribunals in state investor conflict. It also prescribes that the members of the arbitration panels, and I quote, must have specialized knowledge of international trade law. Specialists in other fields, such as environmental law or social security, are not eligible. The Luxembourg Green Court of Justice, it would seem, is simply set aside. If this kind of treaties will further proliferate in the future, there will be one law for common citizens and another for the great multinational corporations. The super rich can bargain with states about how much taxes they are willing to pay if they pay at all. They live in gated communities, they travel by private debts. Their life trajectories rarely intersect with those of ordinary citizens, or should I simply say with commoners. If the commoners competing to impair their privileges, these anti-status neoliberals at once appeal to the state to defend them against the irrational populace. And so we seem simultaneously to move towards an uncertain future and backwards into a high-tech version of the ancien regime. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Jan. Thank you so much, Seep, and uh, a big applause to you. Um, I, I, I would have wished we could all hear the applause, um, so you'll get a virtual applause. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, um, so we have time for questions now. If you want to pose a question to Seep, you can just mark an X in the chat. Um, I, I would like to um, maybe go first on, on this one, Seep, and just uh, thank you so much for this very rich uh, talk. Uh, which goes into the heart of, of some of 
these really, really important ideas about free trade and uh, comparative advantage, which seem to be extremely important ideas in the history of global inequality and the history of ways in which we've been thinking about inequality uh, between nations. So I think this is extremely important. Uh, I think it's, it's really excellent the way in which you you prove, uh, try to prove historically how, how there were a, a certain arrangement around uh, cloth and wine, which came out to uh, one party's uh, advantage over the other through these specific trade treatises. Uh, so I think that that's really, really interesting. And I also think your, your talk um, touches upon this central idea that economic regimes, as you say, are also political regimes. And uh, I think that's a very important point that I'm sure that other people and, and other pa pa panels uh, papers will also uh, relate to. Um, I think I have a, a, a few questions um, here uh, first. Um, one is a little bit um, unfair maybe, but uh, here it goes. Um, so, so, so my question here is, um, is your argument then really against free trade as such, if you're showing that what we actually see in history is that those who are preaching free trade, those who are preaching comparative advantage, that they also have some kind of political upper hand through which they are negotiating specific treatises. So I think the economists might want to ask you, have we ever tried out like really free trade? So that's my my first question, and then maybe I should um, save a few other questions for later because I can see uh, uh, the, the questions are, are coming in. Well, I, I'm not arguing against all free trade. That, that would, would, would not be sensible. I'm arguing that protection is not always bad and that free trade may, may be advantage for some countries, but not for others. So if present day economists ask has there ever been a world of free trade? The answer is, of course, no. There has been no, and, and there probably never will be. I, I would make that prediction with some confidence. But what I'm arguing for is that historically, you can look on the contingent outcomes for different countries in different economic regimes. And there, it is important that not only that certain countries like the United States and are not only dominant economically, but also politically. They can, can block things in the United Nations by their position on the Security Council, and they can influence other countries to go along with them in other ways. And there, there is a, a block of rich countries in, let's say, Western Europe, North America, uh, United States and Canada, and Japan, and perhaps a few others. Uh, the, countries like Singapore and, and South Korea that, that work with free trade to get access to world markets at, anywhere else. So it is state power and the economic regime that are most relevant and the judgment should not be on a simple economic theory say free trade is always superior if only everybody did it. Yeah, that is perhaps true, but everybody doesn't do it. And, and, and on the conditions it is now enforced by the great powers, it is not advantage to many countries who will not go along with it or go along under yours. Because any, any bilateral trades between the United States and countries worldwide presses the United States, presses free trade. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Sip. Um, we have a question from uh, Harry Churchill. Hi, Sip. Um, first, thank you so much for this really brilliant, concise essay. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, now, my question relates to something that your paper perhaps didn't set out to do, but perhaps you had come across some information on and is, is relevant. But I was wondering why you thought that free trade worked for Britain uh, in the process of kind of developing or industrializing where it didn't for um, the United States, Japan or Germany, et cetera. Um, why did Britain not need a protectionist phase? I guess is my question. Well, Britain had an absolute advantage 
in productivity in manufacturers. So there was no there was no true competition. And then you can let everything in. Then you also can export everything out. But at the end of the 19th century, the, the, the scenery had, same, had, had changed because by then there were more industrializing countries at the same time, let's say Germany, France, the beginnings in Japan after the turn of the century. Uh, I forget one, um, Germany, France, Belgium, of course, parts of Switzerland. So then the, the, the young United States wanted to protect themselves against imports from the, the sharp European countries. I think that's the reason for protectionism. And also, of course, it was protectionism was a, a product of the of the civil war, because the, the southern states were for free trade, because then they could export their cotton to, to, to England and to other European countries, while the northerners who were beginning to industrialize were against free trade. And it also was, of course, a punishing measure. That's the political side of it to the, to the defeated south. The modern state the Yankee Leviathan, as, as has been called, was a product of the, of the Civil War. Before the Civil War, there was hardly a center federal state in the United States. Does that satisfy you? It does. Thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Eli Cook. Hi, yes. Thank you for uh, a wonderful talk. I pretty much agreed with you. I especially enjoyed your uh, the temporal argument you were making on the famous uh, wine and uh, cloth example that no one ever does think about what happens you know in the long term uh, my question i guess i have two one is um first of all uh and this kind of gets to what harry was speaking of before the relationship between free trade and imperialism um i'm an american historian and my sense is that uh the tariff was a large part of the american uh, economy uh, until around the turn of the 20th century when they became a more powerful industrial power than england and then for many reasons, they decided it was in their interest to lower tariffs and become free trade. And lo and behold, this is also the exact moment when we get the Spanish-American War, uh, the conquest of Cuba. And so I was just curious that I'm thinking here of, you know, these old articles like the imperialism of free trade. Um, but would you say in many ways, uh, uh, kind of imperialism or at least modern capitalist imperialism is usually driven more from a, a free trade angle than from a protectionist one? Uh, and then, my other question is on, since we're here on inequality, it's more a comment than a question. It's just that I think uh, also oftentimes when you look at countries that uh, switch from protectionist to free trade, not only do you see rising equality between nations, but you see rising equality within these nations. And again, I'm an expert on the United States, but um, certainly uh, since the end of uh, uh, Bretton Woods and the rise of kind of globalization, we've seen a, a meteoric rise in inequality in the United States, and it touches on everything from taxation to uh, deindustrialization. So I was just wondering, I was just kind of just a comment uh, about just kind of different forms of inequality, how there's inequality between nations, but also within nations. But uh, but thank you. It was a great talk. I enjoyed it very much. No, but I, I agree with you about most of these points. The, 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 the imperium of free trade was also applied to the British trajectory in the 19th century, the famous Gallagher and Robinson article. And and the whole critical theory written by the revisionist on the Cold War history of the United States is Lloyd Gardner and the, and the like is also about the use of open, the open door policy. Now, William Edmund Williams has wrote a lot about that. And I liked reading that a long time ago when we were out, getting out of the Cold War mentality, we called it then. But um, you are, of course, of course, right about countries that are where free trade is imposed by exterior powers, often colonial or imperial powers, that inequality within those countries also increases because the, 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 the surplus state activity that's always attacked is a particular kind of state activity, namely social policy. There's nowhere, no, the OECD or the Monetary Fund, nowhere telling countries to spend less on military power. They always have to spend less on social intervention. Thank you. We have a question from Gerardo Sea. Hi, good morning. Uh, thank you so much for this talk. Um, so, I mean, uh, obviously, when we look at the, this issue through uh, through the lens of, of intellectual history, I 
I mean, I completely agree with you that clearly uh, we stop seeing the, the triumph of free trade as a natural, as natural in any way. However, when we teach this kind of thing, say in undergraduate history of the economic thought, this is not just, at least, this is not just the struggle of two sets of policies or two intellectual traditions, but it's also the struggle of different ways of reasoning. So you almost inevitably end up saying, ending, uh, contrasting Ricardo the didactivist, whatever that means, versus the fact that protectionist arguments tend to be more closely associated with different forms of uh, inductivism. In your paper, you also talk about development economics as the rise of non-Ricardian approaches. And of course, one is reminded of Albert Hirschman's matrix about modern economics, plural economics, free trade, uh, protectionism. So I just wanted to know a bit if the story you're telling can actually serve to complicate this story. I mean, what, what is the epistemic status of the little example that Ricardo uh, uses? Is it, uh, is, it, is it, I don't know, an analytic narrative? Is it, I mean, and surely there was, there was more to Ricardo than the kind of uh, uh, way, way we treat him as this deductive is looking for, for, for laws, given that there is to some extent also an attempt to engage with history, even though of course it's in a very different form from say the German historical school or, or even Smith for, for that matter. So I just wanted to know a bit more about what is the what, what is the epistemic side to the story of this kind of of this kind of intellectual thanks. Well, if you look at Ricardo's model, the Hatter and the Shoemaker, that is impeccable. You, you cannot on a, on a that, that, that is quite right, and there are lots of articles have been written by economists about. Uh, X, X countries and, and products, and then it remains right. But I always found Ricardo's example of Portugal and Britain and wine and clothes quite perplexing. But to Ricardo, it came naturally. And that is because he, that I think that is because his geographical place. He looks from, he looks to free trade, that is advantages in the first place to Britain or to England. And there he gets his example. And, uh, and he doesn't look at the long run at all. It is a, a model of two countries who, who, so to speak, remain themselves. The difference between the Portugal and England are naturalized, one might say. But in the history of political economy, the, the, the journal of the history, the history of political economy is also a journal. And when you go through the journal, which I did some time ago when I was in Berlin, um, and in the past, I've also used it a lot. There are two kinds of article in. One kind of article is a sort of finalist Greek history that sees in, in way back in history something that looks like Keynes. I've come across an article somewhere else that where Keynes is likened to Ibn Khaldun. But Ibn Khaldun also says that when every thing comes to the city, then the city gets prosperous, attracts even more, and then the city gets richer and richer. But that's, of course, not what Keynes' argument is about. But there are also quite valuable um, articles that are strictly historical and good intellectual history. I remember an article, um, I forgot the authors, it was about the, the, the French invention of a cost-benefit analysis of public works. James Mill, in his Elements of Political Economy, says all state expense beyond law and order is so much uh, loss for the nation. But they said, let's compare the situation with the bridge and without the bridge. And the, the new trade that is made possible by the bridge, and that is the plus side, and the cost of the bridge is the downside. So then it may be quite rational for the state to spend on infrastructure. And that was a new approach then. So I guess that is what we should do in, let's say, intellectual history of economic inequality, and also, I might add, of arguments for more equality and less inequality. That's also part of the story. My, my, my book on the invention of humanity focused on uh, equality and cultural difference in world history. So equality is also part, part of the frontier text and, and then I'm now writing a new book on the, 
in the same kind of approach, but focusing on, on economic inequality and arguments for economic equality. And the first chapter is called, uh, it starts somewhere in the Middle Ages, and the first chapter is called Before Political Economy. How, how would inequality and equality be defended and argued for and, and against when political economy was not yet come into its own? Because political economy is, becomes an important voice from the mid 17th century on in, in, in England and France and other countries. So, and then you, you get, of course, into, and, and there's also the aspect of gender, which is in the history of political economy, very few discussions as far as you can see, except for the present time when the intersectionality approach has prospered in, out from the United States. But in the old discussions, uh, gender is simply taken for granted. While feminist arguments for equality from the late Middle Ages on, the first feminist book in European history before print, Christine de Pizan's City of Ladies, goes all the way through the Ancien Regime. So gender became, to, to some extent, uh, an essentially contested concept. It was, it was denaturalized, but also renaturalized by others, of course. Thank you, uh, Siva. I think I think we'll just uh, now take a, a new question from uh, Nils uh, Brennes, and I'll just remind you that if you have uh, a question, please uh, mark it with an X in the chat. So please, uh, Nils. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed your, uh, your your lecture. I have a, a basically two comments. The first is that I I, um, I think you can strengthen the argument about about uh, about Britain by looking at uh, what seems to be the extremely protectionist way the British state kept Indian cotton textiles out of the British market just around the time, uh, 1703 and, and that. So, and, and, and there are now economic historians who argue that basically uh, Britain's success in industrializing came because it was the most protectionist country uh, in Europe in the early part of the, of the 18th century. So I think that, that that would actually fit very well into what you would arguing here that they were sort of selected very selectively free traders and kept Indian cottons out so that they could save their their, their woolen cloth industry and be free, free traders with Portugal. Um, and the other thing I, that's just sort of more like a prediction perhaps but I would imagine and I don't know if you agree that uh, I guess free trader free trade is always advocated by the most efficient producer. And I guess that we are looking perhaps into a, a future where we are in the in the sort of in the, in, in the traditional global north, we are fearing being outcompeted. So we'll probably see a lot of argument for protectionism in the coming decades. I don't know if you agree with that. And the last question, I can simply say, I don't know. It might very well be, and it is in the way the economists in the West talk about China points to that. They want to defend themselves against what they see as the incorrect and harmful uh, practices of the Chinese state. So there you might be right, but um, and the, 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 the first point the, the, that the Britain was protectionist vis-a-vis -vis India in the textile market is, is of course correct because um, and, and, and Adam Smith's critique of the East India Company criticizes it because it's both a merchant company and a territorial state. And as, as a territorial state, it must import, uh, as cheap as, must import textiles to Britain, but as a merchant company, it will not do that. So he, 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 he takes it apart to, to, show, to, to say that you cannot at the same time have state power and wield economic power. I think that is not entirely correct, but he had at least some of the some of the things that where we're going on there, he had well, correctly. Thank you very much, uh, Seep. I have uh, I have a couple of questions myself at this uh, stage. Um, Seep, I, I think it's great that you're also mentioning your own work, The Invention of Humanity. Um, I, I think one of the things I really liked about that book is how you say that usually we think about the Enlightenment era as a, as a time when we discover new uh, ideals about equality, right? Uh, equality of, um, um, in economic rights, uh, eco political equality, uh, equality between sexes, uh, etc. cetera. But, but then what you point out in the book is that it's also, as you say, the invention of new ways in which we can legitimize inequality. And one of those you point to is exactly 
uh, political economy as one key discipline. But the interesting thing is perhaps that if you look at the free trade uh, and the comparative advantage theories, it's always um, couched in terms of equality. And I, I think, and I don't know if you want to comment on that, um, there's a very interesting aspect, which has, which is a kind of temporal aspect that uh, when we see arguments for free trade, it's the idea that in the long run, it will create more equality. And that seems to be a very, very kind of powerful way of, of, of legitimizing the idea of free trade being that in the long run, it will create more um, equality. So, so that's my first question, if you wanna comment on that. Uh, the second, briefly, um, goes to this idea of, of um, ideas about human nature. And you, you point out how Smith is making this argument about how it's natural to truck, barter and exchange. Uh, but the other side of that story is that he's also the author of uh, the theory of moral sentiments. And it almost seems like he becomes too much kind of a homo economicus uh, um, theory when you compare him to uh, other such ideas in the 20th century. So first, uh, a question on, uh, let's say the, the temporal aspect of this promise of equality in the future with free trade. And the second question was on um, Smith's ideas of human nature. Well, to the first question, this is a long-standing argument that, that I have with Jonathan Israel. Jonathan Israel, in his three books, or four books on the Enlightenment, uh, 4,000 pages, you can hardly keep up with him, but his thesis is that the radical, the radical materialist Enlightenment is always in favor of equality, justice, and all the good things. But my point is that that cannot be entirely true because there are materialists who are not egalitarians. For instance, look at Diderot, one of the heroes of John Tanisha's story, and um, uh, equality of the sexes. Now, Diderot wrote an article, Sur les Femmes, where he says that women are dominated by the uterus and are therefore incapable of abstract thought or, or not as good as men in it. And he says so because he is a materialist. For a materialist comes naturally to say that, that the body and the mind march close together. Of course, we find the theory that women are dominated by the uterus ridiculous when applied to intellectual history, but to Diderot it was not. Political economy comes on the scene in the mid 17th century when older um, regimes of inequality are no longer credible. The divine right of kings, the natural leadership of the aristocracy, that kind of things. And political economy says that, like Locke says in his chapter on property in, in the second treatise on civil government, Locke's God is in favor of the industrious and the rational. It's a very modern God who wants the same things that Locke himself wants. And therefore, Locke's God can also uh, be used to make an argument uh, on, the natural, on the utility of property regimes. So equality, inequality is not natural, but it's useful because it enhances productivity. So you can justify it in that way. So certain inequalities, the old inequalities are now questionable, but the new inequality between the economically successful and all others is put in its place. The same with race, all theories of the inferiority of other peoples fade away more or less, but the Enlightenment invented the new science of racial classification. And also that is part of a materialist way of thinking because humans are now seen as humans, human beings are not very much apart from animals and other sentient beings, but they're part of natural history. And by placing human beings in natural history, you, 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 you end log logically with the kind of taxonomies that also are used to animals and plants. And that is what modern racism is about. So um, I think it's important to, there is, in my opinion, political economy is more, uh, a new foundation of inequality 
than the foundation of equality. It is needed because the idea of natural inequality is fallen into disregard. You can no longer say that women are women because that's their natural being. That, that's all destroyed. But you can have new theories of polarization of body and mind, of the polarization of the sexes. Rousseau is a good example. He's usually um, put down as an anti-feminist, but that's only late in his career. It, when he was living with Madame de Varon in Chambéry, he wrote an article on the equality of, of uh, the equalité des hommes et des femmes, which is almost literally taken from the 17th century uh, fem Cartesian feminist, Boulain Labar. And then almost 10 years later, when he was a um, sort of amnuensis to uh, Madame Dupin in Paris, who was working on a great book in defense of the female sex, he excerpted, he excerpted lots of books, among them Poulain Lavar, but he also penned down an article in, in, on, on education. And there he rejects totally that boys and girls should have a different education. No, so they should have exactly the same education. Of course, in the Emil, in the early uh, 1760s, he abandons all that and speaks about the, the vain discourses on the equality of the sexes, not telling his readers that he was part of those vain discourses for more than 10 years of, this of his life. So it goes. Um, yeah, I guess that your second question was yeah the second question was on uh, on your view on on uh, on human nature and adam smith um oh yeah being that it, it, it he seems to have a different view than let's say some of the views which are seen in 20th century economic thought where you really get this idea that that all we ever do is out of economic self-interest that you see in someone like uh, Gary Becker, for example, in the 1970s, uh, where you can explain all kinds of human behavior being economic behavior, strictly speaking. It seems like Smith's view would be somewhat different since he uh, he's also uh, writing about moral sentiments. I yeah, what... that, is, that, that was long, long ago, that was used as das Adam Smith problem. Yes. But nowadays it's resolved. Like Adam Smith does not say about the market, the market can by itself, if the market is free, uh, hold the economic sphere together. But the market cannot hold the state and society together. You need something more for that. And that is his famous principle of moral sympathy. So compare that with um, uh, Margaret Thatcher's um, point that she made in the House of Commons when, when she says, pointing to Hayek's road to serfdom, I don't believe in society. There is no such thing as society. I see only individuals. That is what Adam Smith's report is. That society and the market, that the market is society and society is the market. So th there Adam Smith was of course an enlightenment thinker who was well aware of the problem of political obligation and political stability and, and didn't believe that the market by itself was up to, to, to stabilizing the state, nation, uh, moral community. Thank you, uh, Sip. Uh, we have a question from Melanie Guichon. Yes, and firstly, thank you, Sip, for an interesting talk. I just have a small question uh, regarding the latter part of your presentation. Uh, when you were talking about present-day uh, neoliberalism, you said that you deli deliberately used uh, global financial aristocracy rather than elite. So I just became curious why this distinction, if you would elaborate on that. Thank you. Now, I, I briefly pointed to it in the last part of my talk. Yeah, I think an aristocracy is not overdoing it um, because in, in these treaties and the state investor tribunals, there is one law for the aristocracy that is the high financial uh, corporations and, the, and the, their boards and the people who gravitate around there and another law, law for common people. That was, an, that was the same in the ancien regime, and the aristocracy and commoners. So, um, and these commoners, the, these aristocracy live also in a world quite insulated from others. The others don't count actually for them. 
they are living gated communities more and more. They travel by private jets. They, they travel first business class or something else. They're also insulated. And that for the aristocracy, for the French aristocracy, they used to have sex when, when servants were present because servants were things. Servants were not, be, not human beings. So they, there is a certain way of looking at the common people that is coming into its own now. And if that goes further in that direction, if it's not corrected by democratic movements, it, it will become more and more. And it's also doing something else with these uh, trade investor disputes and, and with the, the tax evasion that, that the multinational corporations pay hardly any taxes anymore. And that the tax foundation of the states of the European Union, of the states of the European Union and of the United States is eroded. And who is, has to pay? Of course, the commoners. But they can't, uh, can't, can't go elsewhere. They can, can, cannot bring themselves in a letterbox company in Mauritius or some other places. The, the, Netherlands, have, the Netherlands is also a tax haven right now. There, there, there are thousands of letterbox companies in Amsterdam. So I think an aristocracy is uh, yeah, I think you can use that term. People will, of course, question it, saying that is a historical, and that people are all equal now, but in the economic sphere, they're no longer all equal. Thank you so much. Um, in a few minutes, we will we will close uh, off this uh, session. Um, Seep, I was uh, wondering whether you'd say a little bit about one of the uh, kind of a key phrase that you use in your paper and, and here today as well, because 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 you give us this picture of a, a world um, uh, economic world of commerce, which is not just this kind of natural system where things are exchanged, etc. Uh, and then you use the phrase that it's uh, the real world is, is characterized, you say, by combined and unequal development, uh, which I think um, which seems to be to be a pretty accurate description, but you don't go so much in length and kind of justifying or explaining what you actually mean by combined and unequal development. So a few words on that, perhaps as a final final question for this great session. Yeah, the, 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 the notion of combined and equal development was actually invented by Leon Trotsky after the 1905 Russian revolution in, in his paper results and prospects, where he says that, Russia, of course, focusing on Russia, Russia has a quite small modern industrialized bourgeois sector. It has a large peasantry and it's also, uh, uh, it has as yet a powerful aristocracy. And that precisely that combination of factors in the Russian scene made revolution in Russia possible, but revolution was improbable in the high tech and economically developed states like France and England. So that was a new approach to revolution, but also to how uh, the modern economy works. And, and Lenin used also in his booklet on imperialism, I, I don't like Lenin very much, but there he made a point, he said, the empires are developing not at the same pace. At a certain moment, Britain was the, the greatest empire, but later on, another state can overtake Britain and other states in the world, Japan is of course a case in point, can fight for their place in the world. And that makes it highly unlikely, and, and that is the importance of the argument in my paper, that a complete homogenization of the, uh, of the global economy will ever come about. We will have, we have to live with disparities that grow over and over again. Does that uh, help you a bit? Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Seep. And this is, I think, a very important theme, and it uh, it will be something that we can relate to uh, later again. Uh, I know in in Melanie and, and my paper, it's it's something which could be discussed again. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Seep, for this wonderful uh, keynote lecture. We're so glad that you could uh, come by uh, here, so to speak. So thank you so much. A big applause to you. Um, we now have a 30 minutes break until our next panel, which is uh, on India and Pakistan, which we're looking very much forward to. Uh, in the 30 minutes, there will be kind of a pause screen here. There's a, a breakout room for speakers, like a speaker's lounge. You can join if you want to, uh, if you want to have your coffee on your own.
uh, please feel free to do so. But see all of you in about 30 minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. Fine.